The Dark Side of Love. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot as she called us to live to a higher standard each day. To not be satisfied with just throwing a little religion into life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we wrap up our five-part look at deliverance from depression as we think about the dark side of love. Also, we'll take some time to get some feedback from listeners to Gateway to Joy. Our guests today are Janet and Jeff Benj as they talk about what part of Elizabeth's life they enjoyed researching the most of their authors. Also, Rachel Johnson is the creative media director for the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, and she'll talk about some of the response the foundation has had of sharing the writings, the speaking, the, the wisdom of Elizabeth Elliott. Right now, we wrap up our five-part series, Deliverance from Depression, The Dark Side of Love. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot, completing today five talks on the subject of deliverance from depression. Someone sent me this article called The Dark Side of Love. This was in a Christian magazine, and this man writes, I've seen their pain, and I must honestly state that I don't have the answer. You can find them almost anywhere. People who became vulnerable to the irresistible pull of love's call and are now nearly crushed as a consequence. Sincerity, idealism, passion, caring, name it what you will, These people were motivated to give themselves selflessly to others, to love their neighbors as themselves. Love took on many expressions, feeding the hungry, church planting among super-resistant Muslims, struggling to free those trapped under the tyranny of oppressive governments, creatively working to interrupt the cycle of poverty that imprisons generation after generation of urban poor, patiently slogging through the jungle of emotions with teenage victims of sexual abuse, and dysfunctional families. The reward for these love givers was not the miracle of changed lives and grateful hearts. On the contrary, their efforts were rewarded with estrangement from the closest of family members, biting criticism, firing from ministry positions, bankruptcy, and divorce. What was once the vanguard of gentle, tender, sacrificial servants became the bedraggled company of bitter, crushed, and confused prisoners of compassion. Integrity requires us to reject the simple answers and mindless rehearsal of Bible verses that so easily flow from the mouths of those who have never entered the vulnerable territory of passionate loving. A dreadful darkness and unutterable pain have become companions of these angels of mercy, and our insensitive verbal prescriptions only move them further down the tunnel of despair. Sometimes I've stood at the cliff's edge of that valley of pain. I've been consumed in those moments by fear, a gripping panic, that I was only a breath's nudge away from falling over. And sometimes I've been tempted in the agony of those moments to step over the edge and fully lose myself in the pain. Complete darkness appeared a more welcome friend than the call to stay in the unbearable light. Some may think me crazy to paint a picture of such ravaging hopelessness. But then I say, such people have never entered into the fellowship of Jesus, who screamed out in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a darkness covered the earth. I have interviewed Christian leaders who have told me that in all of their decades of ministry they have never known difficulty. Rather, their companion has simply been the joy of the Lord. For them, the harshest of words are reserved. They're either liars or deluded lunatics who years ago bought a ticket to Disneyland and never found the way out. Their words are poison to the sick-hearted, chains for the downtrodden. 
Now, I want to make you very aware that that was not Elizabeth Elliot speaking. That was reading from an article that someone had sent me from a Christian magazine, and the person was asking for my comments on this. I was appalled to think that if we give a scripture verse to someone who is in deep darkness, we're really doing the only thing we can do sometimes. If it's given in a glib and offhand way, of course, it may not be received. It may not be received even if we give it in the most loving way, but it is the Word of God. And on this program, it is my earnest prayer and hope that the Lord will enable me to speak His words with love, with compassion, and always with the willingness to be judged myself by the standards of Scripture and to live by those standards. Now, what's wrong with this article? I believe that it is never necessary for a Christian to become bitter. And I do believe that we can learn to accept anything and everything that happens in the light of Romans 8.28. And that's a verse, of course, that people don't want to hear sometimes. It says, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. When we're in the dark valley or going through the deep water, we don't see why or how this can fit in. But we are not asked to see. We are asked to trust. In Hebrews 3, verses 6 to 9, we read, But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. And we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. It's a pretty big if, isn't it? We are his house, Christ's house, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. You see, God is pointing out there that the response of most of those people in the wilderness, people of Israel, was not a godly response. Their hearts were going astray. They would not consider the Lord's ways. And they tested and tried God, even though they could see the miracles that God was doing for them. It was also God that was leading them through that waste, howling wilderness. It was the Lord himself who took them to the bitter waters of Marah in order that they might see that even in the bitter waters there could be sweetness when the tree was thrown into that water. That's an Old Testament forecast of what the cross can mean to us. There's a hymn that says, Bane and Blessing. Bane is a word we don't use much, B-A-N-E. It means trouble. Bane and Blessing pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. And now here's a letter from Evelyn Underhill, written in 1932. She says, You are very often in my thoughts, for I know what a desperately hard time you must be having and how much prudence as well as courage you will need to get really on your feet again and recover your hold on life. In a way, the fact that you accepted the sacrifice so fully in the first instance may possibly make the inevitable psychological reaction especially severe. I hope that may not be so. But if it, if it is, my dear, and you are troubled by uprushes of bitter or violent feeling, rebellious thoughts, exasperated nerves lack of interest or any of the other miseries by which our unstable psyche makes us pay for great strain. Do not blame yourself too much. Do not get frightened. But reckon this in as the result of the heavy blow which has, as it were, left a bruise on the subconscious that may work out in one of these humiliating ways. Consider that this, too, is suffering. And therefore, and this is the most important part, therefore can be 
humbly offered to God. Offer your suffering to God. Do not try to struggle with the situation and its difficulties, but so far as is in your power, turn from it to other things. In this case, obviously, a special love and interest in your other children. Fill your mind with them and every detail of their time. If you do go away for a bit, let it be to a place where your interest and attention is filled with active work and you have no time for silence and meditation and living through it all in thought. When it all seems unbearable, talk about it. Do not brood or practice suppression. When you find in your prayers that you are moving away from thoughts of God to thoughts of your own unhappiness, stop, get up, read if you can. If not, do not hesitate to turn to some active occupation. Short aspirations, constant thoughts of and appeals to God will be better than long prayers just now. Now that's a very simple, compassionate letter to someone who had obvious, obviously been going through some deep waters. And the Lord knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. To me, that's one of the most comforting words in Scripture. Also, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has seized you, but what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. We don't need to collapse, in other words. James 1.12 says, Happy is the man who endures temptation. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Don't be bitter. Take it to the foot of the cross. Get down on your knees. Perhaps this might be a gesture that would help you. It helps me. Get down on your knees. Put your feelings, the hurt feelings, the bitterness, the anger, whatever it is, in your hands, as it were, and just lift up your hands to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't handle this, but I know you can. And so I relinquish it to you in the name of Jesus Christ and I will not retrieve it. Gateway to Joy 1311, The Dark Side of Love, Deliverance from Depression, Part 5. That concludes this short series. A little bit later, we'll be hearing testimonies from Gateway to Joy listeners. Right now, it's authors Janet and Jeff Bench as they talk about what part of Elizabeth's life they enjoyed researching the most. I know this isn't the most exciting part, but I really loved learning about her relationship with her parents, particularly her father. And I loved learning about how he took on the Sunday School Times uh, ed editing. And I just felt like that was such a, an interesting choice for him to make, having been a missionary himself. And in many ways, Elizabeth sort of followed that same trajectory. But he thought that children were important enough and the job was important enough to um, really give his life for that. And I, I found that really interesting. You know, those magazines and the Sunday School Times were like the social media of today. And uh, Mr. Howard, Elizabeth's father, was, uh, you know, putting his, uh, his stories, missionary stories out there for everyone to read. And I do think that much of what she did later in her life was following his example. Yes, and for me, I think that uh, the part that I enjoyed most researching about her life was stuff about the Warani and how she went in there, how she developed relationships with these people, met people who had killed her husband, etc. And just to begin to understand so that it was the other side of the other of the book that we wrote on Jim, and we began to um, delve in and understand who this group of people were, and we began to see them really deeply as these these human beings and in, in need of God in their lives, and so I think that uh, that was really interesting for me. And of course, as we began 
diving in and studying that part of it. Then we ended up writing a book about Rachel from that, that we went even deeper, who, you know, Rachel and Elizabeth went together back to the Warani and uh, quite a, an involved study of the Warani and the, the two women's lives amongst them. Authors Janet and Jeff Bench. Thank you. A little bit later, we'll be hearing from Rachel Johnson, the creative media director for the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, and she'll talk about some of the response the foundation has had to the efforts of spreading the writings and the, the speaking ministry of Elizabeth. Right now, let's hear some more testimonies from listeners to Gateway to Joy. And one thing that I do hope this program brings into your home is the assurance that God is faithful. He will never leave you or forsake you. The Bible does say, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. But I discovered that in the Greek, there are five negatives in that verse. Did you know that? Greek has five different negatives. If we put two negatives together in English, it makes a positive, doesn't it? So you can't really translate that verse in any way other than to say, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. So listen to these testimonies and be encouraged. Some of you will identify precisely with these experiences. Ours is a family, says the first, that has endured many hardships. Often we have suffered in pain, praying for the courage and strength to persevere. Certain that God's grace would sustain us and that we must hold fast in troubled times, we have been humbled, maturing in our faith, remaining united as a family, love and faith our bond. Your program has given us both a comfort and the inspiration to continue. With God's help, we find peace when in our pain, knowing that he is with us, our lives a living sacrifice to him. Ours is a peace that passes understanding. Even now as I write, we have lost our home, we are bankrupt and separated by distance as my husband seeks work in another province. I struggle to maintain some sense of home and security for our children. Much of your instruction I include in my letters to my husband in an effort to share with him the support you give. Daily we pray together, although it must be brief and by phone, and the children and I spend each evening in study of God's word that we might all understand what he requires of us during this trial. With Christmas approaching, I feel it's especially important to focus on rejoicing at the beauty of its true meaning, the Savior's birth. For surely no loss of material possessions could overshadow the glory of God evidenced by that night in Bethlehem. Yours in faith, she signs it. Now here's a sad one, but it's a woman who is also learning to trust God in a, in a very difficult situation. I listened to your talk today about staying home with your children. I agree wholeheartedly with you that the most important job a mother has is to raise her children. I am the mother of a boy and a girl and I work full time. There is nothing I desire more than to stay home with my children. Unfortunately, my husband does not share this desire. Please listen to a woman's viewpoint. He says I must work because of economical reasons. My heart breaks every time I leave my children at the sitters. My husband knows how I feel about this. I've been praying about this for three years since the birth of our son, but God has not chosen to change anything yet. All of the radio programs talk about the woman who wants a career and goes off to do what she wants, sacrificing her family in the process. No one seems to have any advice for women in my situation. I know my God is able to change things, but what if that never happens? How am I supposed to cope? They say the first three years of life are the most important. Well, my son is already three, and I'm still working and miserable. Can you offer any advice? The only thing I can offer is to keep on praying. If your husband is a Christian and would be willing to talk to your pastor, 
I would hope that maybe your pastor would be able to get through to him what God says about the responsibilities of fathers. But isn't it a sad situation when money means more than the children? Well, but the fathers would say, you can't raise children without the money. God's word says, my God shall supply all your need. And I have many, many testimonies from families who have gone right out on a limb in faith, trusting God to supply their needs. Now, the needs may need to be separated from the wants. And anybody who has tried to live on one income in today's world has probably had to make sacrifices. How important are the things sacrificed by comparison with the children? Unfortunately, the children are being sacrificed in place of things. May God help you to trust him for your situation. Another letter. I'm writing today to thank you wholeheartedly for speaking the truth in love on your broadcasts. I deeply appreciate your ministry and drink in the godly insights you give. I know that your position concerning careerism in women will necessarily produce a barrage of angry letters since it is so directly opposed to the philosophies of our day and those that many sincere Christian women have swallowed. There is so much confusion. Thank you for a quiet, calm, clear voice. After almost 10 years of marriage and work and still no children, I found that the Lord was quite distinctly leading me to retire from the working world. My husband and I were always running, it seemed, and the, quote, important, unquote, was always put off. Time for others, healthy habits, etc. We just maintained, and this seemed especially hard on me. By faith, with prayer, I brought the idea to him. He really balked at it, initially, but did, by God's grace, come to agree. And again, by faith, we decided I would resign in one year, regardless of whether or not we were expecting a baby. I had had two miscarriages during these years. And she says in the margin that the finances were bad, they were in debt. Well, Elizabeth, God really honored our commitment. Five months before the quit date, our daughter was conceived. The timing was like a confirmation to me. We stuck with our decision, despite many who didn't get it. At the bank where I worked, etc., I really sensed a lot of patronizing and even pity. People don't understand. But we're not of this world, right? Why should the misunderstanding and scorn shock us so? Anyway, it has been tight financially, depressingly tight at times. It has been an adjustment for me. I can't believe how much time it takes to care for one baby, manage the household, keep up with my husband, etc. But now I have the energy and the focus to make a difference in our family's life, and I know this is where God wants me. It's like the illustration you gave of your little brother Davy in the waves. You just have no concept of how good it is to obey God till you have the view from the other side. I had told the story about how my brother Davy refused to go and jump in the little waves with my father or mother because he was afraid of the ocean when he was about three years old. And at the very end, the last day of our vacation, he finally did what they had been trying to get him to do all week. And he loved it so much that he burst into tears and he said, why didn't you make me go in? Well, that's the way it is with God, isn't it? He's trying to show us that obedience is the way to joy, and we're balking because we fear that we're going to lose something. We're afraid of that ocean. And so this writer goes on to say, don't expect them all to understand, Elizabeth. Honestly, we are a brainwashed lot with TV, magazines, etc. But please keep challenging women to bring this matter honestly to God. So let me repeat, please bring the matter honestly to God, you listeners. Will you do that? Do it for God's sake. Thank you so much for your encouragement. Now, can you think back over these letters that I've read today and see how each one, in another way, testifies to the faithfulness of God? Even the prayers of that mother that have not yet been answered in any visible way. Do you think God is not listening? God is listening. From the moment that woman started to pray, things 
went into operation in the unseen world. That's what prayer does. Prayer is an engine that starts processes. And only God, who is sovereign, knows the best way for them to work out. Will you trust him? Will you obey him? Thanks for listening. Gateway to Joy 256. Testimonies from listeners. Well, before we go, speaking of testimonies, Rachel Johnson, Creative Media Director for the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. You might say the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation is the umbrella organization that seeks to uh, spread the word that uh, was so important to Elizabeth uh, through her writings and through her speaking. The response has been incredible. I mean, just the fact that we've only been in existence not even for three years and already the number of people that have um, come to find out about the foundation and will regularly just email us with their encouragement or reach out to us on social media, just how much it's changing their life to have access to Elizabeth, her talks and just her words, whether it's in print or digitally, it's just been so encouraging um, to so many people. Now we're all close to 60,000 people um, follow us on Instagram, which is just incredible. And it's, it's not really following us, it's following Elizabeth, but ultimately it's following the board. Rachel Johnson of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. Well, our time together is just about over. Hey, thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe as you got some exercise, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org. More talks, devotionals, videos, Gateway to Joy programs, and other resources. elizabethelliot.org. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are those everlasting arms.